Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Klein. I'm the director of P20 Initiatives at Northern Illinois University, and we're back with another episode of Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads. We're really excited about this. We've, we've had wind energy. You may have seen that episode, and the individual who, who was our guest in that episode, his background, he he was a nuclear engineering student as both a, for his bachelor's degree and his master's degree, and he's never done anything with nuclear engineering. Well, we're going to take care of that with this episode because we're really excited to have a guest today who works at the Byron Nuclear Power Plant. So, um, Jackson is our guest today. I'm going to turn it over to you, Jackson, to introduce yourself, and then we'll start asking questions about your career and your work. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so for everyone, um, my name is Jackson Martinez. I'm an operations shift manager with Exelon Corporation. I'm a civil engineer by background with a bachelor's degree from the Illinois Institute of Technology. I work at the Byron Nuclear Power Station, which is located in Northern Illinois. I am licensed by the federal government to operate the two nuclear reactor units at Byron Station. We produce electricity 24 seven and all year round supplying about 2,500 megawatts of electricity, which is enough to power approximately uh, 2 million households. Uh, organizationally, I work for Exelon, which is an electric utility. As a corporation, we work in all major areas of the electric utility business, from generation of electricity, to distribution, to competitive sales. I work within the generation division, producing electricity for our customers. That this is this is awesome. So, I mean, those numbers are just incredible to think about. And we'll come back to that. You have two million households being powered and uh, having the the power plant running twenty four seven. We obviously all, if we're watching this, understand the importance of this. I almost made a dad joke there and said the power of this. Um, so, with that said, tell us what like a typical day or a typical week looks like in your work. Sweet. Uh, I'll give you a month. Uh, okay. Let's see. So, um, so I lead a crew. So my crew and I work on a rotating 12 hour shift schedule with a five week rotation. So we rotate between working days, nights, weekdays and weekends uh, with our fifth week being a training week during which my team goes through a requalification process that includes dynamic scenarios in our main control room simulator as well as written exams. Um, now, a rotating shift work can seem tough, but it does come with some perks. Uh, so for example, uh, between two of our work weeks, uh, I do have a span of seven days off, which is part of my normal rotation. It's effectively a seven day weekend. Mm -hmm. Now on a typical day, I arrive at the nuclear power plant and go through security checkpoints to access the plant. It's very much like going through an airport. We have a dedicated security force on site given the nuclear technology that we use. From there, I make my way to the main control room uh, of the plant. Visually, the main control room is, um, is like the inside of a spaceship. The control room has indications and control switches for plant equipment and is where my team monitors and operates the two nuclear reactors we have on site. The main control room is manned at all times, and when I arrive, I take a turnover from my counterpart on the previous shift. During the day, uh, my team works with other departments such as maintenance and engineering to perform surveillances and work on plant equipment. Um, we test equipment to ensure that the equipment functions as designed. We also modify our plant, our plant to upgrade components for safer and more reliable operations. At the end of my workday, I am relieved by a counterpart shift manager working on the next shift. Very cool. Um, so the, the can we go into a little bit more detail about the training part of that, the ongoing training? So if I understand you correctly, every five weeks, you're re-engaging in on-the-job training, essentially. Is that correct? Yes. So um, I think it's one of the most surprising aspects of the job that a, a lot of folks don't necessarily know about mm -hmm. is uh, training is a cornerstone of what we do. We go through rigorous training to do what we do uh, to start, uh, to even be qualified to be in the position. I had to pass an intense 
two-year training program to obtain my federal license. This program involved written and dynamic test scenarios with evaluations from representatives of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. My training ensures that I know the plant like the back of my hand and can respond to equipment failures. It's very much like, uh, like flight pilot training. My team and I operate Byron Station day in and day out, but we are trained specifically for responding to casualty situations to ensure that under all conditions, we maintain our reactor units shut down and cooled. Uh, pr my primary function is to protect the health and safety of the public. Once qualified, I attend training every five weeks to ensure I remain proficient in my role. Uh, training is a, is a cornerstone, as I said, and it's not just for operators. Um, we train all sorts of individuals. For example, our maintenance and chemistry technicians also attend training to ensure uh, proficiency in their field and to learn about changes in the plant in terms of processes and designs. Yeah, you know, that level of training, I mean, I've worked in school districts where teachers have time for professional learning every week, which is, which is fantastic. But that level of training that you're doing, it actually reminds me of uh, pro athletes or musicians who are, who are training, really, right, all the time, and then performing just as well. And that's really what you guys are doing. And so, so that's really neat. I want to come back and talk a little bit more about the training, but let's go back in time. Uh, walk us through kind of your education. I mean, you said you went to IIT, but walk us through what those, what those steps of required education were. And one of the things I want to know about is that two-year training program to get qualified. Like, where did that fall into all that? So if you can, you can take us back to high school if you want and um, and walk us through from there, the educational process. Okay, uh, so I would say it started um, really in, in high school with my love and passion for math and science. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew uh, that I was uh, very good and enjoyed math and science, so I stuck with that. Uh, that led me to a afternoon a program in high school where I got to learn about the engineering, project management, and architectural fields. That's where I, I learned that I, I, I had a passion specifically for engineering. Uh, I chose civil engineering going into college um, to a degree as a guess based on the um, experience that I had thus far, I, I had learned through this afternoon program about opportunities within civil and architectural uh, mm -hmm. engineering and structural engineering as well. Now in college is where is where things really blossomed. I, I was involved in a number of uh, organizations for professional development and I network and uh, was able to talk with a lot of uh, representative from Exelon. Uh, so I, I landed an internship opportunity with Exelon at the Byron Nuclear Station. Um, while I was there as a civil engineering intern working on structures monitoring and, and, and looking at the, um, the, the health of cement structures, uh, I did get insight into Exelon as a whole and the operations field as well. Now, when I um, came in full time, there were opportunities for me to expand and broaden my knowledge base beyond civil engineering. Mm -hmm. So I took a plant engineering role where I uh, worked hand in hand with operations, looking at specific systems within the plant. If you could think of the plant as like a human, a human like a um, just a human body. It's got mm -hmm. all the intestines, all these plants that work together simultaneously to make the plant work. Uh, so I was in charge of a number of systems within uh, within the facility. And that allowed me to then gain insights into the mechanical and the electrical engineering fundamentals. Uh, with that, um, there was the opportunity to go to initial license training or ILT. Uh, that was the two-year program that I completed. To, to be part of that, there is a, uh, you have to go through a screening process, which involves basic math and science, as well as um, what we call a speed test to a degree. It's called a POS uh, test. And the intent of that is to evaluate a candidate's ability to respond and analyze data quickly to garner solutions and, and reach conclusions. So those two uh, prereqs were what allowed me to then um, go into the program. And the, the program itself is very intense. 
Um, to learn the plan like the back of your hand, you, you have to have exams it's effectively every week. And the passing minimum is 80% with an expectation from our management team of 90%. So, and you, you're looking at integrated plant knowledge and understanding how things fail and what actions as an operator you would need to take to stabilize the plant. Uh, <clears throat> wow. So having completed that and now working um, on rotating shift, we do go back every five weeks to retrain. And the intent of that is to, uh, to keep us on our toes, uh, mm -hmm. sort of keep us proficient to make sure that we um, um, understand the different circumstances that can come our way. And we go through uh, as many scenarios as you know, our training staff can think of. So tell us about what type of knowledge and skills. I mean, you've just you just said the math, the science, the analyzing data quickly and accurately. Mm -hmm. um, but if if you were talking directly to someone who was 16 or 17 or 20 years old and they said, I think I might be interested in this. What do I need to be good at? Um, what are the things you would say any kind of skill that they need to be good at to be successful? OK, uh, for that, I would say uh, teamwork and communication. That's that's the key. I work in a team. I work in a in a team environment where we look to each other's knowledge and experiences to solve problems. We are open uh, to one another about where we may need some help to improve and aim to support one another while we're, while we're at work. Um, we have an expectation for communications, which we call three way communications. Uh, so when we have two or more people communicating, uh, we validate communications by repeating a person's communication and ending it with, that is correct. So for an example, if a field operator is going to turn a valve uh, and they have to communicate to the main control room, they'll say, a control room, this is field operator John looking to manipulate valve XYZ. The main control room will then say, understand, uh, John, you are ready and in the field to manipulate valve XYZ. And then the field operator would then end it with, that is correct. And so this type of communication is what we do day in and day out. It's second nature to us. So it's it's interesting when I find myself doing this at home uh, to some weird looks that I may get from my loved ones. But it is, it is uberly important for us to communicate clearly, concisely, and so that everyone understands um, where we're at in, say, a surveillance procedure or an operating procedure. So I listened to a very, very long book last summer about the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. And it, in that book, there was a lot of excerpted, ex, transcript excerpts from actual mission control to astronaut conversations. It sounded very much like what you just described with three-way communication. Um, it's, it's not the fastest way to communicate, but it is definitely very accurate. And, and when you want to avoid making a mistake, oh, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, this is a better way to communicate for sure. That's right. Uh, that's great. So teamwork and communication. I mean, right, if someone's just going to focus on math and science and think that they can be an individual engineer and be successful, it sounds like that's probably not going to work out so well. That's right. It does take, uh, I would say, the, the science behind it builds the foundation, but the teamwork, the collaboration, the communications is what really makes it work. So thinking about... We, we actually, let's let's turn this into two questions. Civil engineering first, and then not just nuclear energy, but the energy field second. From your perspective, how would you, uh, what would you consider the job prospects to be over the next 10 years for civil engineers, as well as for uh, people looking to get into the energy field? Uh, so within the energy field, I would say definitely stable. Uh, within Exelon itself, uh, it is important for us to maintain a talent pipeline mm -hmm. to ensure the continuity of the business into the future. Mm -hmm. um, we provide uh, electricity, so that's, that's a commodity. That's something that we uh, we as a society need, and uh, frankly, we take for granted, right? We take mm -hmm. for granted that when we turn on the light switch mm -hmm. or tell Alexa to turn on the light switch, mm -hmm. that it's going to work. Uh, so... Um, we, we really focus on maintaining a talent pipeline. Uh, plus, it's really our new employees that bring so much to the table for us in terms of innovation and drive. Uh, building on the culture of inclusion that we have at Exelon, we've seen our employees approach situations or challenges from a different lens, allowing us to uh, use innovative technologies to solve problems. So for example, um, we used to send divers 
into perform inspections of underwater structures. Uh -huh. Nowadays, we use robotics and drone technologies for these applications. This is exciting stuff, and uh, we are in need of employees that know and appreciate this technology uh -huh. to allow us to see past the status quo and find ways to leverage these technologies. Um, now, from a civil engineering and just broadly engineering perspective, um, engineers, we solve problems and our world will always have problems to solve. So it's certainly something uh, definitely for, for like a young individual to look at prospects. There are certainly there. Uh, there are always advances in technology with regards to structures, with regards to roads, bridges, um, and even br in broader terms, like the medical fields for, for other engineering disciplines where we need uh, folks that have a passion for, for math and science to really take us to the next level. Awesome. Um, what What do you like most about your job? What do you What do you love about your job? Oh man, where do I start? Uh, let's see. So I think the biggest thing with regards to uh, my job that I love is the opportunities that my job grants me. Uh, <clears throat> my My job allows me to be so. Let me, let me take a step back. So at Exelon, we have employee research group, resource groups or ERGs um, that allow us uh, employees to volunteer and be involved in their community. I love to do that. And Exelon grants me the time and actually really prioritizes for me to, to be involved in my community. So as part of many of these employee resource groups, I've had the opportunity to uh, volunteer at high schools, at colleges, uh, presenting um, what a career um, may look like within Exelon and within the energy field, as well as serve as a science judge for various competitions. Mm -hmm. So for me to be able to give back and, and have a, a company like Exelon that really um, showcases that and, and emphasizes that as part of my career is, is great, and I love that. Uh, the second part of that would be uh, I love the people that I work with. I work with on a team with nuclear professionals, top-notch individuals, uh, folks that are frankly smarter than I am, and that's great uh, to have an opportunity to lead folks um, with such a caliber is awesome. Uh, we're able to to really pull on each other's um, experiences and knowledge to look for innovative solutions, and I think that's what really makes things uh, turn for us, especially when we're working, you know, on a night or on a night shift weekend. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's, that's awesome stuff. So thank you for sharing that. Now you already told us that, and, and you saw my reaction to the amount of training and the ongoing cyclical nature of the training. That was very surprising. You said that's one of the most surprising aspects of your job. Is there anything else about your job that's either surprising to an outsider like me, or that maybe is part of the job that people in the control room don't really like to do, but it's an important part of the job and anybody who's interested in in becoming part of that field should be aware like hey this is part of the work too okay uh so i've touched on it a little bit i would say uh, a tough uh, certainly a, a challenging part of our job is the fact that we have to work uh, we're in an industry where we have to work 24 7 every day of the year so that's that's days, that's nights, that's weekdays, weekends, and even holidays. Uh -huh. So to accomplish this, my workplace has five operating crews that work a rotating shift schedule. So we're all offset to be able to meet the schedule. Uh, we have minimal manning requirements. So this can be uh, challenging as one has to be accustomed to working both days and nights. Uh, this requires balance and preparation, I would say. For me, key to being successful while working rotating shift work is to plan ahead and to know when I will be off to make family and personal events and to look to take time off as needed. Um, I also invested in blackout drapes, which is a must <laughs> sleep during sunny summer days. Uh, I work with many operators that have worked many years on a rotating shift and have families. Um, they would also say that planning ahead is key to also enjoy that seven day weekend uh -huh. previously mentioned. Um, our work is like like that of like a hospital staff uh -huh. that we, the workplace has to be open 24 seven. So, so we make uh, all accommodations necessary for that as well. Cool, that's great. Um, Maybe this is an easy one. I suppose there's a whole group of people who might argue that it's not an easy question to answer. 
How do you believe your, your job has a positive impact on the world? Okay, so um, I would start off by saying that, that we power lives. So we provide our communities, communities with electricity 24 seven, every day of the year. Uh, I feel we've, we've grown as a society to take electricity for granted. So we expect it to be there. Um, so there's a lot that goes into being able to turn on our light switches reliably and expect to have electricity available for use. Uh, my team works diligently to produce power safely and using a technology, i.e. nuclear, which does not produce greenhouse gases. So in that respect, we are a green technology. Uh -huh. Awesome. And then we'll wrap up with this. Mm -hmm. um, Thinking broadly, it doesn't have to be about your career specifically. If you, and maybe you've had the chance to do this when you've been interacting with high school or college students, but if you got to talk to a young person, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22 years old, just what advice would you give them in general as they're thinking about what career they might want to engage with? Great question. Um, I would say uh, first, um, look inward. To, to see what drives and motivates you. Uh, for me as a kid, I knew that I loved math and science. So I knew that I want to do something in those fields. Um, the next is to be open about opportunities. As a kid, I never thought I would be working at a nuclear power plant. Uh, the opportunity came out with an internship at Exelon. Uh, I took the internship with an open mind, uh, seeking to learn. From here, I never looked back, and I've continued to learn and build on new experiences. I think it's important for young people to be open about things they may not necessarily they may not necessarily know much about, and to see if they could see themselves in such career roles. If anything, this can help um, people or individuals make an informed decision about what to do and don't like, while removing any of the unknowns or uncertainties about certain jobs. That, that is great advice. It is almost like uh, all of the people who are working on career ed kinds of stuff with students throughout the state of Illinois. It's almost like you are, are one of those people saying those things, one of those teachers or uh, administrators at the school district or the post-secondary level. So thank you for that great advice. Okay. It has been a real pleasure, pleasure having you. Um, I guess I'm going to finish with one last question because there's going to be all kinds of young people watching this and they're going to wonder about this. You know, their exposure to a nuclear power plant is is in one form and it's a cartoon. Mm -hmm. So you you know where I'm going with this, right? Oh, you know it. <laughs> yeah. So so tell us it, how much how how similar or dissimilar is it to Homer Simpson's experiences in a nuclear power plant? I know what I'm hoping you'll answer. Oh yeah, so I get this question a lot actually. I figured you did, I figured that. So we're nothing like the Simpsons. Um, so I would say we do have cooling towers, so that is a similarity. But uh, beyond that, I'd say that's probably where it ends. Um, we, the nuclear technology that we use, so the fission process, it's, it's powerful stuff. Um, we're looking at uranium pellets that may be the size of your nail. And that small fragment, uh, can produce so much energy, thousands of equivalent pounds in coal, hundreds of barrels of oil uh, in such a small volume. So that's that's powerful stuff. But I'll quote Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. So one thing that's overly important for us and is what we work around is to make sure that we produce electricity in a responsible and safe manner. So my team, uh, whether it's in our training, in the way that we monitor equipment, we're always thinking about uh, how are we going to keep our reactor safe so that we can continue to produce electricity for the long term. Um, so uh, that is that is what I would say regarding just the nuclear industry as, as well as a whole, is these facilities are robust structures. They are fail safe. Um, uh, facilities, meaning that uh, when something goes bad, the, the facility aims to shut itself down without any operator interference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, there's uh, we as operators just validate that automatic um, logic schemes are occurring and we take action if not. Uh, but generally speaking, ultra safe facilities 
Uh, they have backups upon backups to make sure that we can accomplish certain functions. And like I said, uh, uh, day in and day out, we we hang out 100% power producing uh, the electricity that our society dearly needs. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for being with us. And for those of you watching, uh, this is this is the shift from school year to summer uh, Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads. You may be watching this in the middle of the winter, of course, and so it doesn't matter. We are going to keep producing Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads, and we want you to let us know what careers you think are useful careers for us to uh, highlight in a Career Pathway Virtual Trailhead. If you have a specific individual you think would make a great guest, or if you have specific questions that you would like us to ask, connect with us on Twitter at P20 Network. That's at P20 Network, all one word. And we look forward to bringing you more in the future. Thanks again for being with us today.